when you started losing jobs and your car broke down, did you have a feeling as to why that was happening? Yes, I did. What was that feeling? Well, I was told. They told me they were going to destroy me. I'm going to the witness be admired. Okay. We'll sustain the objection, and your attorney asked what was the feeling that you were having, so you can answer that question, sir. I had a feeling they were going to kill me or drive me to suicide. You left and you went to Orange County. What did you do in Orange County? In Palm Beach County. Palm Beach County. I got a condominium close to the home where my children and ex-wife live, not too far away in Wellington, and um, went out looking for, for employment. And did you get a job? No, not in, not in the beginning. Remember before I told you, I, no matter where I was and what I was doing, you dropped me down in the middle of nowhere. I redo my, I can update my resume, put it on the go out and speak to the owner, someone in authority, tell them what I want, up front, sincere with them, I'll get the job, always. All did, you sudden, have did you have problems getting a job at this time? All of a sudden, I couldn't get one. I would go in the first time, and it would be the same as always, and, and then when I would follow up the next time, it was all of a sudden, they were looking at you like, you, you know, you, you, when you have an interaction with someone and, and, and you go back the second time and you can tell that something has changed very dramatically and they're just looking like, like they don't want anything to do with you at all. And that's what it was. The first time it was fabulous. I'd go back to follow up. The second time, they don't want anything to do with me. Did you they're know, anxious to get me out of there. Did you know why this was happening? They were following me and ruining my job opportunities. Uh, I was also being followed at the time um, by, and it was the same vehicle. It was new, new Ford Explorers with Florida State personalized plates on them, and they were following me wherever I went. I also had a, a answering. I had a non-published number, and soon after I moved into my condo with a non-published number, I got a. I started getting messages on the answer machine that would take up the whole tape, so I couldn't get any messages of people calling me back for jobs, and it would be this weird music in the background chanting, this weird satanic music in the background chanting would take up my whole tape. Did you eventually get a job in Palm Beach County? I went to placement agencies, and uh, they, again, it was the same thing, except for this one place I went to called Career Planners, Career Planners Incorporated. And when I walked in, it was almost like they were expecting me. They said, come right in, Jeff. Took me in, uh, I reviewed my, reviewed my resume with him, and they told me, there was one fellow in particular, he said, I got the perfect job for you. Where was that job? At Aquin Financial Corporation. What is Aquin Financial Corporation? It's a corporation that has, um, it's a scam. What, was, what was the legitimate job supposed to be? It was supposed to be at a bank that it had called Berkeley Federal Bank and Trust at the time. I think they've changed the name. And I thought that was unusual because I know after I had, I, I know a little bit about finance and banking. And I know my credit history after my divorce has a lot of people who were shot. My credit history was shot. And you can't get a job at the bank with that with a credit history shot, they just won't hire you because it's, it's just not good business, I guess, for banking. And I knew, but, it, but they knew all that, they had all that, and he said, yeah, we're gonna put you in this bank. You're gonna be in the uh, customer service department, working uh, with the main computer system, which is really sophisticated. I told him, well, I've had some experience with computers before, but not really that much. No. What, what exactly was your job title at that time? Customer service representative. And what exactly was your job to consist of? Well, um, the one suite, the suite where I was located, the customer service department, and there were six other people like myself, and we're all brand new. And I'm working the computer system, and I check books out of the library to figure out how to do it, the Windows 95 and all that. It's a very sophisticated computer program uh, system. And I started, and, I, and I'm trying to pick things up as quickly. And I'm a quick study. So what I would do, uh, people, I found out that Auckland's business was procuring large blocks of loans at very deep discounts, non-performing loans from the Federal Department of HUD, Housing and Urban Development. Huge blocks, 
hundreds of millions of dollars worth. Did this make you kind of curious? I'm saying, what am I doing here? And, and, and when I started working my job and they would call in and, and they were supposed to be, and these were supposed to be authentic HUD borrowers, previous HUD borrowers, and I would access their accounts, it was the same information over and over again and the same voices over and over again. And it went very quickly and I was pressured to do it more and more quickly. And, uh, and I would go and they had all the mortgage files imaged in the computer system and I would access and go to this department, that department, email. I was running the company. And there I was a temporary person. There was like six other things, a lot of pressure. And, but I thought, this is odd. I know how debtors are from working at GMAC before. I know how they are when they approach their financial institution. And these people weren't like that at all. It was strange. They weren't conducting themselves. And again, it went so quick. And I, I began to realize this was false information that I was adding, in the, I was putting in the computer. I was filling the computer files up with. And I, and I thought maybe it was um, one of those uh, frequent shoppers, they call them, programs where a company will, will send confederates in to, to uh, impersonate clients, customers, and you and to train you. What? what? Are we going to sustain the objection? Yes. All right. We'll let the counsel continue the questioning of the defendant. What did you ultimately discover at Alcon Financial? This is a scam involving the federal government, hundreds of millions of dollars. Overrule the objection. And it's a money laundering operation for organized crime. What did you do based on your discovery? I started making copies of all the false data I was entering in the files. Covertly, I thought. But they, I found out later they knew exactly what I was doing. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that answer. I found out later they knew exactly what I was doing. I approached the manager, Stuart Moore, and said, I told him, it's, you know, some screwy going on here. And he said, I don't know what you're, I don't know what you're talking about. There's nothing like that going. These are actual bars. So what I did is I took this the information that I had and I went to the comptroller for the state of Florida, Dave Patel. He had an office in West Palm Beach there because they just built a new a federal complex for the state of Florida there in West Palm Beach. So I went into his office and talked to him, showed him what I had. He told me that this. Objection, Mr. Walls. I'm not going to get into what he told you. You can proceed to answer your questions from your counsel. Based on what you had discovered, you went to the <coughs> comptroller of the state of Florida. Yes, I went to the authorities. All them FBI. Did you go? Did you send any information to the FBI? I took it by their office. This is right there around the corner, West Palm. I sent it to the division of thrift division in Washington, D.C. I sent it to the Department of HUD with accompanying letters explaining exactly what I found out. They were making trips back and forth to Boston all the time. They originated in Boston. They didn't have any other branches. They, it was hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, they were dropping hints to me. I didn't tell them about my background at all. I wanted to forget about Key West completely. I blotted it out of my past. Did people seem to know about your background? They knew exactly all about me. They, the ones that had been there a long time, the ones that were really running the, the, the scam, they started dropping hints about Key West. They had friends in Key West. They're going there this weekend. How are your children? I never told them I had children. How are your children out in Wellington? How are they doing? Uh, my, one of them, my wife works for the... You said, you said that you believe this was Boston-based mafia. Yes. Did you connect that with Key West at all? Yes, because the rum runners is Boston based mafia running rum runners. So you believe that the Aquin financial scam was connected somehow with Key West and rum runners? Yes, because they began torturing me at Aquin once they found out what I did and I returned them in. How did they torture you? Well, you couldn't hang up on the people that would call in. You'd be fired if you did. So you'd leave them on the phone. And again, I know what debtors are like. You don't parade your, your whoever's holding your mortgage, you don't. And they would berate me for hours and hours. People would leave at 5.30 and I'd be in there for hours with someone after everyone was left and he just berated me for hours. These con Confederate people, they had put up to it. Did you ever feel that your children were in danger? Yes, I did, because they started mentioning Eric, Erica and William and they were, they were using my family to get at me. They were trying to destroy me, put me under all this stress. They knew from my past that I, from when I've been in very stressful situations, it, it has its effect on me, and they're giving me uh, everything they had. 
They were trying to make me kill myself. Were you finally fired from that job? Yes, after I turned all the information in, Stu knew about it, uh, I was called uh, one night by Career Planners Incorporated, and they told me not to go back to Aquin, to come back there and get my stuff, the last check. Did you go on to another job in Palm Beach? I was very fortunate. Uh, I contacted a hospital I worked at before, Sandy Pines in Tequesta, Florida, and uh, when I first contacted them this time, it was the same situation all over. The human resource, I go in and it's great, follow up, they didn't want anything to do with me. Well, they lost their human resource person while I was at Aquin, and they got a new person. And the new person who wasn't connected evidently reviewed my resume, hired me on the spot. Okay. So I started what, at, at Sandy Pines again. What were you hired for? Psych tech, working with children. Working with children? <coughs> How long did you have that job? Four or five months. How was the job at first? First, it was great. I'm very good at it. Uh, the children trust, trust me. I feel that children should be protected. Their innocence should be protected. Mr. Wallace, you've answered the question. We need you to be responsive to the question and not go off in tangents. They gave me as many hours as that. I, I was working 70 hours a week. Did you enjoy working with the children? Yes, very much so. Did you feel you had a special talent to work with children? Objection. Yes. Sustain the objection. Did something happen that you lost that job? They got to me there. How'd they get to you? A fellow I'd worked with before there named Brad. He shows up all of a sudden. He's a physical therapist there. He had been before. He shows up in a guy like he. I asked him what he'd been doing. I haven't seen him well. Objection, hearsay. Okay, sustained. <laughs> what happened that you had to leave this job? They let me know they were there too. You felt like you were being followed. Objection leading. All right, well, we're going to overrule that objection. You can answer the question. <clears throat> the human resources person was offered uh, a fabulous job. The one that was my friend. Wallace. The question was, did you feel like you were being followed? Yes. Why did you feel that? Because they caught up with me. They told me. They were there. They told me. Did your hours start getting cut? They cut my hours back to nothing. For no reason. Were you able to make a living? No. Did you feel that somebody was making it so you could not make a living? Yes. And who was that? Satanic cult in Key West. Put ties to organized crime. Lots of money. Lots of people involved. It's nationwide. They communicate on the internet. They, they, they want you out, they'll get you. If you ever read the Satanic Bible by uh, Anton LaVey, under you know, this is non responsive. We'll overrule that objection and let Mr. Wallace finish his response. You've ever read that Bible, Satanic Bible, under human sacrifice? It says how they can take anyone out they want to. All they have to do is imagine that they've been wronged somehow by this person, and they have some kind of magic to them. They can take them. They have every right to kill them. When you left Sandy Pines, where did you go?
I didn't have any choice. I had to go back here to confront them. Confront them. When you say you didn't have any choice, what do you mean by that? They wouldn't stop till I was completely dissolute and homeless. Harassing me, all of the things they'd done to me, which I'm some unable to talk about here, uh, let me know that, that I, no matter what I did, that they would destroy me. So I had to confront them. No choice. When you say you had to confront them, what did you mean? I had to come back to Rim Runners, where it all started, and confront them. Were you planning on killing them? No, I was not. I never. Recess, a little break here. No. Not cared about him. <laughs> Even after everything they've done to me. I thought I thought if I presented myself to them, that they would remember who I really was. And I was no threat to him at all, not in any way. And all their sinister things and their crimes, I, it didn't matter to me. I cared, I cared about them. I tried to understand them. Uh, I thought that uh, when you say you, they would leave me alone. When you say you were going to present yourself to them, can you be a little bit more specific what you meant by that? Well, there's two things involved. One, that I, was, I had the hope that when they saw me again, they would realize who I was and they would leave me alone. And two, since they were following me all around, everywhere I went, watching everything I did, dropping hints to me about my personal life, let me know they were watching me all the time, trying to destroy me, to break me, uh, to drive me over the edge. I've, I've, I thought, that since they were performing all this theater on me, these mind games with me, trying to ruin my life, trying to destroy me, that I was going to turn it on them. You since were going to present theater to them? Is that what you mean? Yes. Since they were watching me all the time, they're watching everything I did. I everything I did, then I would give them something to watch. And what do you mean by that? That's when I bought the gun, and I bought the suit, the black suit. And I figured since they knew all this and the ammunition I bought and they would see all this, that it would intimidate them. So if one didn't work, maybe the other would, and they would leave me alone. So you believe that they would have known that you had bought these items? I know they knew. And them knowing, what would that do? Again, if it didn't work, if I if they decided not to leave me alone because if I couldn't appeal to their humanity, then it would intimidate them and scare them into leaving me alone. You came down to Key West, you got a job at Rum Runners. Yes. What happened the night before April 7th? I was in the hideaway bar and uh, I was kind of teasing this gal that hung out there all the time. Because uh, I liked her, she talked to me. She's actually a cocaine prostitute, and she'd hang out there all the time. And it, but she had a good, good personality, sense of humor, and I was just kind of ripping her because she was very obsessive about foosball. And she was playing this fellow, and she was getting beaten, and that didn't happen very often. So I was kidding her, you know. I was kidding her, oh, you're getting beat, and things like that. And, uh, all of a sudden, she just flew off the handle and she slugged me in the stomach. And um, when that wasn't effective, she jumped on me and bit me on the neck. Why'd she bite you on the neck? She told me they were vampires. Not real vampires. 
I mean, you know, not the supernatural, just people who drink blood as part of satanic rituals. They consume, they drink, they do. They drink the blood. Going to April 7th, 1997. Were you at a barbecue picnic type event? earlier that day? Um, no, if there's any food there, I wasn't aware of it. I came there later. I wasn't aware of that thing at, they had. At this time, had your hours been cut at Rum Runners? Yes, because spring break was over. And they uh, they don't need, they need about a third or less of the people they usually have. Maybe less than that, the people they usually have. And uh, just let those go. Um, I told Billy that uh, you know, I'd like to whatever I receive, give me just to keep me strung along, so, you know. And uh, he said that put your number on the bulletin board and you'll be like an on-call basis. Whenever we need somebody, we'll call you. Did you know that your hours were, to, were going to get cut at the yeah, end of spring break? Happened every year. Were you angry about that? No, no. Billy said he'd call me. I had a job working during the day for Paul. I had plenty of money in the bank. I had $700 in the bank. My rent was paid for two months. I wasn't worried about it. Okay. You say your rent was paid for two months. You had paid all the way up until the middle of May? Yes. <clears throat> and you had money in the bank? Yes. Did you go to Rum Runners on that evening? Yes. Okay. What time do you think you arrived? I'm not sure. I think it was around 10 o'clock, 9 or 10 o'clock. Okay. And how were you dressed? A uh, shirt, pair of shorts on. Normal, casual clothing? Yes. Did you get into an argument with someone that night? Yeah, I was in uh, first in Rum Runners for an hour or so, a couple hours listening to Kevin. And then uh, I had a couple of beers, and I went back to the hideaway. And in the hideaway was Frank Labriola his name, the bartender, and uh, Danny Leon with his uh, girlfriend who was a dancer. And uh, Is that the same Danny Leon you had had an argument with in 1996? Yes. Okay. We already cleared that up though a couple of weeks ago for sure. We, I apologized if I offended him and he shook my hand and told me that he respected me. Okay. So at this point there's no animosity Not from you all. towards him? Not at all. At did you, on that evening, have words with Danny Leon? Yes, what happened, was, I walked up to the bar, Danny was sitting there with his girlfriend, and Frank was behind the bar, uh, Brian was over to the side. And uh, I was thinking the other people were there. It was early yet. And uh, I sat down, and Danny ordered a uh, Jägermeister shot for, I guess it was the girl he was with. And Frank pulled a bottle, uh, normal, right there in front where he was, and, and it was already had to speak it in and everything. And he pours the shot for the girl, and so I saw it and I thought, well, you know, it, it goes well with beer sometimes. So I said, well, I'd like one of those also. And he already set the bottle down. And when Frank was going to pour mine, instead of reaching the same, he just had it in his hand. He just had the bottle in his hand that he poured the drink for the girl and set it down like that. And I said, I'll take one of those because he just poured it. He says, okay, reaches down here and pulls up the bottle, another bottle to pour the drink for me. <coughs> and I said, why? He just had the bottle in his hand. He just poured the drink for the girl. And he, he almost had his hand on it. And I asked him for one, and he pulls it from down here. Inside, pulls up the bottle and pours mine. Was there anything unusual about that Jägermeister, how it appeared? Yeah, it looked strange. It was like watered down. Something was wrong with it. It wasn't like Jägermeister, it was thick. It's like syrup, it's like cough syrup. It's thick, and this was completely different. What did you think? They were drugging me again. Did you ever taste that Jägermeister? No. I told Frankie about it. I said, Frankie, uh, I'm not I, I don't, I'm changing my mind. I don't want it, after all. And he looks at me, 
He says, what? And I said, I, I don't want it after all. It looks kind of wired or something. I don't want it. And he, he turns to me and Frank says, I knew I didn't like you. He didn't know. Or no, he said, I knew. I knew. I knew. I knew. I just, I knew I didn't like you, that's what he said. And I was thinking, I just met the fellow. I just met him. How did he know he didn't like me? I mean, I just met him. I hadn't said anything to him. You know, what, 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 I didn't understand what was going on. And I realized that they were telling him, they were filling him in. He was in. So you believe that the Jägermeister was drugged? Yes, I do. I mean, what other explanation is there? Why would he pull it down here when he just had his hand on the bottle? They drugged me twice before. I know they had mass, they had quantities, roof and alls there. I know that. The first from someone told me that, anyway, I know they had him, and, they, and he did it around here. That's what he was doing. So he tossed the Jägermeister drink and, uh, and then said that. And then Danny turned to me again. I, I, Danny just, I just talked to him a couple weeks ago. He, he shakes my hand, tells me that he respects me. And he turns to me with a scowl on his face and says, yeah, I've been wanting to kick your ass since the first time I met you. Did that surprise you? Where is he coming from with this? We just talked two weeks before. Again, I had nothing against him. We just, he, he told me he respected me uh, for a while. I mean, I, I gave him advice about his marriage, about the difficulties he's going through, his divorce and all that, and his children and stuff. But where was he coming? Why was he doing this? It, it didn't make any sense at all at first. Based on all this that happened, what did you believe? That they weren't going to let me alone. That it wasn't going to work. They weren't going to stop. They weren't going to stop until I was completely destitute, living on the streets, whatever, and I, and I killed myself because that's part of the thing. It's powerful magic to them when you get somebody to kill themselves. And why, I, why did you believe that they wanted you to kill yourself? Since I knew everything about me, they knew about my past, <clears throat> and I had an Achilles heel as far as that's concerned. And, uh, and again, it's powerful magic to them. If they can get you, they, they consider, there's a lot of ex-Catholics involved in it, I guess. And uh, they consider it a very bad, terrible sin to kill yourself. It's not scriptural. But that's part of the dogma of Catholicism. And uh, they consider it just powerful magic for them to get you to kill yourself. And I was not going to kill myself. I was not. And I was not going to let them sneak up on me and murder me the way they did Savannah and try to make it look like suicide. I murdered Savannah, try to make it look like suicide. What did you decide to do? I was going to have to confront them for good. I was going to confront them in a way where they would have no choice but to kill me. If they were going to kill me, it was going to be in public. It was going to be in front of people. Again, they weren't going to sneak up on me. They were going to kill me right there in the bar. And it would, and it would, there would be a lot of questions asked, and they would be held accountable for my death. And hopefully, it would, everything would come out, and what it would did put you a do? stop to it. What did you do at that point? I uh, was. I moved around to the side of the bar and sat away from them, and I was sitting by myself. And somebody I, I knew sitting next to me who wasn't part of this thing. He was just a patron. And I said, told her, turned to him and I said, and I was really, what I did eventually, just to be able to appease him, because it didn't matter anyway, just to appease him, I said, Frankie, give me a Jägermeister shot. He says, okay. He gives me the Jägermeister shot and I drink it. And I'm sitting there and uh, it's very strange. Did you say anything to a bar patron? I turned to the guy sitting next to me and said, I'm so on, on edge, I, it feels like I dropped acid. And that's what it felt like. Because when I was, you know, freshman in college, you experimented and I dropped acid a couple of times. I know what it's like, that's exactly what it was like. Did you ever quote from a novel? 
-hmm. Again, it is a very strange experience. Very strange. It's always loud in that bar, really loud. Especially when the band's playing, it's just loud. And all of a sudden, it's, it's all quiet. And uh, things are just kind of running together, like you're on acid. It, uh, melting. Things are melting. It's like you're on acid. And I turn and walk, and I'm walking, and I walk out of the bar, and uh, I'm going to allow them to kill me. They won't have any choice, they have to kill me. Uh, I turn to the people who are sitting on the benches on the, in the rear exit, and I knew them, and, and a couple of them were all right. They didn't, they weren't involved in this. And uh, I turned, uh, I quoted, I quoted Sid, Sidney Shelton from The Tale of Two Cities when he was given his life for his friend. And uh, the quote is, it's a far, far better thing I do than I, than I have ever done. It's a far, far better place I go to than I have ever known. Did you go home at that point? Yes. <coughs> what did you do when you got home? I got dressed to put the suit on. I put the gun on, I got the ammunition. Again, it was a two-fold thing. What do you mean it was a two-fold thing? There was still a little bit of hope, even at the end. There's a little bit of hope that if somehow, somehow they would leave me alone at the last minute, they would remember who I am, and if not, then I could intimidate them into leaving me alone. Again, they were watching me all the time. They knew what I had. They dropped hints to me. They called me shooter. They talked about my gun. I never mentioned any of this. They talked about my gun. They said the Wallace drill when they when I show up. Everybody knows the Wallace drill. They had Steve say he's going to kill all of us and laugh. Uh, the band would play "Bullet in the Head" by Rage Against the Machine every time they saw me and laugh. Do you that, feel that your life was in danger? I knew it was in danger. Well, the objection. They told me, they let me know I was in, da in danger. They, they, that very night, I was told later that the band was shooting the gun with blanks at the audience during the Rage Against the Machine song. They knew I had the gun, they knew I had the suit. They knew how much money I had in the bank. They told me how much money I had in the bank, all of it. They'd make jokes, come to Key West and go broke and laugh while mentioning exactly the amount of money I have in the bank. Uh, After you got dressed, and you got your gun, what did you do? I went back. Did you smoke a cigarette outside the bar? Yeah, <clears throat> I stood out in the alleyway on the street and uh, I was going before the firing squad. So I'm I sorry, I, I couldn't hear that. What did you I was going before the firing squad, so I was gonna have a last cigarette. I was smoking the last cigarette. When you say you were going before the firing squad, what do you mean? The Wallace drill. I present myself in there and the way I was attired with a gun on me, they would shoot me, they would kill me. It was the Wallace drill. They knew they were expecting me. So you expected to get killed? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you think you could walk away? No. Why? For why prolong it? I prolonged it. This is, I can't describe it. Why prolong agony? Get it over with. If they're gonna kill me, I'll present myself. They'll kill me, it'll be in public. And there'll be, and there'll be a lot of questions asked, and there's a whole lot to uncover there. It would have a purpose. It would put a stop to all this stuff when it's been, when it's been investigated. It would put a stop to all the stuff they were doing. All the people they were harming with the drugs the gambling, the extortion, money laundering, cocaine smuggling, Satanism, all of it, underage people. You remember there have been articles in the Citizen about the very thing, that satanic cult is down here. Uh, did put you, a stop to it. Did you go into the bar? <clears throat> yes, I walked in, I walked up the steps, I walked past the people I talked to earlier, I walked by Danny Leon, standing right there by the pool table, and I walked past him and walked up to the bar. You saw Danny Leon? Yeah, he was at the pool table. What did you do when you got into the bar? 
I went to the end, at the end of the bars like this, this lengthwise, and I went to this end, there's no one there. So I stood there, I stood there. There were three of them, Michael Sumner, Michael Francis, and Brian Sawyer in a row watching the ball game. I figured they were keeping track of the ball game for the booking operation they had going. And they were watching it. And uh, I just stood there and I looked odd. I figured, I figured it was the spectral appearance that I had would shock them into doing something. What were you hoping they would do? They would kill me. You were hoping they would kill you? Get over with and kill me in front of everybody. Don't sneak up on me and kill me. Like they did Savannah. They make it look, try to make it look like suicide. Throwing her out off an eight floor balcony in Miami. She was a dancer at the upstairs bar a few years back. Stiffed him on a drug deal. They killed her. Try to make it look like suicide. They weren't gonna do that to me. They were gonna kill me right there in open. Everybody would see. Not everybody was involved in their thing there. Some uh, uh, an innocent witness would see, and they so would what, be held accountable for it. What happened? Nothing. They all three, like in a row, turned, looked at me all at the same time. Again, I looked bizarre. My head was shaved. I had the suit on. They knew I had the gun and everything. They just looked all at once. All three looked at me, and then looked back at the TV, like I wasn't even there. Did you feel you could walk away at that time? No. Did something overcome you at that time, at that moment? Again, for some reason, it was completely quiet. It was completely quiet. I didn't hear anything. And then the fellow that I knew before ran up to me at the bar. I knew the good guy, he wasn't involved in this. He'd just been working there that season. He's a good guy. And he, and he yelled at me. I know what he said. He yelled at me to get my attention. I looked at him. I didn't want him to be hurt. I knew he was fixing to be. A dangerous situation when they killed me. I didn't want him hurt. So I told him to run. And he couldn't hear me. That's how I knew it was loud. And I saw so I spelled it R-U-N, run. And then I turned to look at them again. Uh, I got the cue. What was the cue? Evil prevails when good men do nothing. Where did that come from? I don't know. I thought it's, the voice sounded like, my mother has a recording, the only recording we have of my father's voice, because uh, he died when I was young. And it was like his voice, like my father's voice. But. I didn't think it was him, I thought. I thought a higher afford, authority was appealing to me. And, uh, and what he was telling me is that it's okay for me to defend myself. My life is at stake, my family's life is at stake. I felt that they got into my children. They were gonna kill me. It's okay to defend myself. What happened after that? nightmare. What do you mean by nightmare? Chaos, horror, people are screaming. They grabbed me, somebody grabbed me, and a uh, bunch of people grabbed me. And somebody forced the gun, I twisted out of my hand. And uh, a lot of people started beating me, beating me on the head, 
mainly because everything else was covered up. I was stretched out like this over the bar. So everything was covered up except for my head. And they were beating me on the head with all kinds of things, their fists, all kinds of stuff. Hit me in that vibe with a, with a bottle, breaking the bottle on my face, cutting me, grinding broken glass in my ears, uh, putting a choke on my coat, choke cold, uh, crushing my, my esophagus, strangling me. Did you expect to live that night? No. Do you remember talking to the police that evening? Yes, later. You heard the confession? Yes. And you heard yourself say the word premeditated? Yes. Why did you tell the police this was premeditated? I respect the police. Respect the job they do. I like Detective Larkin. I thought he was a good man. I figured once I was to be able to explain everything, since they knew what was going on, they know. All the cops down here know what goes on here. They all know. Some of them deal drugs themselves. I mean, everyone down here knows what goes on here. No one does any authorities, police, no one does anything about it. But I figured that they wouldn't become police unless they had something deep down in with them that's decent, that they want to do the right thing. And they want to protect people. And so I thought once I explained everything to them that they would understand. And so I wanted them to think I was courageous. And I went to this fearlessly, which is not the case at all. It's completely opposite. But I wanted them to think that. And I wanted them, I wanted, since I was afraid of going to jail, that they would leave me alone in jail. Do you have a tattoo on your left arm? Yes. What is it of? St. Michael, Archangel. Okay. And what did St. Michael do? He threw Satan out of heaven. He's a protector. He's a warrior angel. He protects people. Do you know further questions at this time?